There's no worse feeling in film photography than getting your poorly exposed scans back from the lab. You invest all this money into the film, into the development costs, and you just end up with a bunch of unusable black rectangles. This video aims to help you with that. What I'm gonna be doing today is an overview of metering in different forms. I've got a camera meter, I've got handheld meters, and my idea is to talk you through it from the kind of the concept of a meter and what a meter tries to do, ending off with different metering techniques to ensure that you get the best possible negative. I wanna point out that there is an element of subjectivity to metering, and the only person that can judge a good exposure or correct exposure is the photographer themselves. It's your choice to see the scene and say, right, I want to meter for this specific part of the light. I want to meter for my shadows, my highlights, whatever. There are people that kind of belligerently just take the photo and uh, you see it when people post, look at this happy accident and they've got their, their C200 that's three stops underexposed. I think that a happy medium is uh, accepting that a good exposure is an exposure that has a significant latitude and it gives you the option of making your image high key, low key in the printing stage or the Photoshop stage as that might be. Let's jump into a discussion of what the meter actually tries to do. For all of their smart features, for all of their averaging modes, highlight and shadow buttons, meters are pretty blunt instruments. What they're trying to do is put your exposure slap bang in the middle of the histogram so that there's room in the highlights and room in the shadows for the rest of the subjects in your scene to fill. If you look at the, um, the histogram as just, I mean, middle gray will just be a blip right in the dead center. You'll see that the meter's actually making quite a savvy choice. It's reasoning that because most scenes have a degree of contrast, that if it leaves an equal amount of space above and below, you'll be able to fill that with the rest of the stuff in your scene. Imagine you have a person standing um, next to a, uh, a, a white wall and a black cat. You wanna have the person exposed, but you also wanna have a little bit of detail in the wall and a little bit of detail in the cat. So they try and help you out, but obviously it's not always the case that you want to have your exposure right in the middle. And you have to help your meter out with that because occasionally it will get a bit confused. If I give you an example of the sun as a backlight, that's a famous one where people will point the camera at their subject with the sun behind their subject and the meter will try and average out anything on earth with the sun, which obviously skews way towards the sun. And you end up with that classic silhouette with the, the kind of burnt out orange dot and then all of your foreground just as a, a general sort of vague shadowy mess. In the 70s, they started putting meters in cameras and the best meters for the cameras are TTL meters. You can see some of the old cameras will have like the selenium cells built onto the front or sometimes around the lens barrel like on the Trip 35s. But having a TTL meter is a big deal for photographers. It allows you to see while the camera's up to your eye what your meter's doing. And it also allows you to meter through filters. They're great for photographers, but a slight issue with them is that they can be fooled because they don't know what the subject is. They don't know the scene you're photographing. I'm gonna use this picture I took of the dog in the snow as an example. This was taken and I'll put the histogram next to it. And you'll see that I had to actually tell my camera to overexpose this scene by almost two stops. I'm gonna show you what it looks like if I just normalize the histogram to the middle. Pretty dark, pretty, uh, pretty unusable. And, uh, and that is the big pitfall of reflective meters. They don't know what your subject is, so you have to account for your subject. We've talked a bit about in-camera reflective meters, but let's talk about handheld reflective meters. The most common form these take are spot meters, and uh, this one here, this is a Minolta Spot Meter F. So 1980s bit of kit, but still very reliable, very useful tool for taking accurate meter readings. These work best when you know the exact characteristics of the film you're shooting, because if you know, for example, that your slide film has two and a half stops of head ring, uh, where you can put your highlights, what you can do is you can take a reading off the brightest part of your scene. I often use uh, the middle of white clouds, but you can use it on uh, whatever bright object is in your scene. Take a meter reading and, uh, and you know that you've protected your highlights. Likewise, if you know that your film sees three stops into the shadows, what you can do is you can take your meter reading off the darkest thing that you want detail in, in your scene, press the, uh, the shadow button, and you'll have kind of three stops into the shadows. You can obviously do it all in your head, just because this one has a little computer built into it doesn't make it that much better. But using a spot meter gives you a much slower and more um, 
I guess, intentional style of shooting. If you're using something like, uh, let's say you're using 8x10 Velvia, where every single sheet that you shoot is an enormous investment, it does make a lot of sense to use something like this. Because if you know your meter and you know your film, you'll know exactly what will and won't be, uh, be kind of in the last sheet of your film. The key thing to remember when using reflective meters is that it's really important how you aim them. With a one degree spot, obviously it's quite hard to miss your subject, but if you're using something like a reflective meter in a camera, you have to be really careful that you haven't got point light sources throwing off your meter reading. Famous examples are uh, glare off metal and glass, or even that sort of light that glances off the surface of the water when the sun's a bit lower in the sky. If you do have one of these incredibly bright point light sources in your scene, what you'll end up with is an underexposed foreground. It's happened to everyone, and uh, what you should do is make sure to take a meter reading that doesn't have that glare straight in it. Let's imagine an example where we're shooting a car and um, there's a big glare coming off the bonnet. What you could do is take a reflective meter reading of the same light, but without the car in the scene. And in that way, you'll be kind of insulated against those kind of pitfalls. With a spot meter, obviously make sure that you're pointing it at a, a middle gray and you can actually get exposure cards, which are a big middle gray piece of reflective material that are absolutely calibrated for your meter. If you're gonna take one meter reading, make sure it is something like an exposure card, but I'll give you some tips to cheat. Um, foliage and uh, particularly grass is quite good as a substitute for middle gray. Um, just look around your scene, you can sometimes use certain tones of uh, like the sides of buildings for an average if you know that they're uh, about as reflective as an exposure card would be. But if you're going to take one reading, I don't recommend a spot meter. These are best for having a look around the scene and doing a bit of averaging. If you're going to take one meter reading, then I suggest you use an instant light meter. Look at that segue into the next chapter. Instant meters solve a lot of the problems with the reflective meters, but they do introduce a couple of problems of their own. If you think about the last chapter where we're talking about watch out for the reflectiveness of your subjects, make sure that the white dog's in the highlights, that there's no glare or glass in the scene or whatever, these don't have that problem because they're not measuring the light as it bounces off things, they're measuring the light as it arrives. With this one here, this is a Minolta flash meter four, what you have is a, a lumosphere and actually any instant light meter, you'll be able to tell because it will have one of these white bubbles on it. If you look at my Sekonic, um, this one actually has the, the Lumosphere as well. Basically, what you're going to try and do is place this little white orb in the same plane as your subject. Uh, they say you want to have this perpendicular to your lens and just one click gives you the meter reading. If I was, say, uh, setting up my video camera and I wanted to take a meter reading, I put in my ISO, I put in my shutter speeds, and then what I do is just place that next to myself, give it a click, and you'll see that, let's say I was videoing it at 1 30th of a second at ISO 160, F4 would be my answer. These are good, but they don't account for some of the things that reflective meters do, so there is a little bit of uh, a choice to be made about which one's more suitable for you. Actually, this Sekonic kind of cheats because this one's also a spot meter. But let's talk about the, uh, the things that these aren't so good at. A big one is that these ones aren't very good at uh, accounting for your filters. And in fact, I say aren't very good at, but they, they can't do it at all. Let's say you're, uh, you're shooting with a polarizer. You're gonna have to actually go into your meter and say, oh, my 400 speed film is now 200 speed because the polarizer takes off a stop. Or uh, say you're using a red filter on black and white, that's three stops. You're going to have to do that manually, and if you forget, there's no coming back from three stops underexposed and black and white. The advantage of these is that you can get a really quick and simple meter reading just by walking up to your subject, pressing the button, and uh, as long as you're metering the same light and you're the correct distance from your lights, the, uh, the instant meter is fantastic. I'm actually just going to touch on that distance thing because that is a bit of a problem when using flashes. I don't know if you guys know, uh, it's, we're going to get real nerdy talking about inverse square laws but the light of the flash actually diminishes a lot. Every couple of paces you take away from the light, the, the actual metering value will drop off rapidly. If you think about the sun as a light source, the distance between the sun doesn't really matter, because if you think 
If you take a few steps as a percentage, you're really not moving relative to it. But when you're using something like a on-camera flash or a studio strobe, it is really important you walk to the same distance your subjects will be and take the meter reading there. If you take the meter reading really close to yourself, uh, I'm imagining a scene, right? Okay, so let's say I've got a flash on this camera and my subject is 10 feet away. And I'm like, oh, I can't be bothered to walk over to them. I'll take a meter reading like this. That's gonna go horribly wrong because the, the flash will obviously diminish as it travels out towards your subject. Um, bit of a random example, but yeah, just walk to your subject and make sure it's 90 degrees to your subject. The reason the, uh, the perpendicular thing is important is because if I tilt it like this, um, I'm obviously I'm getting more light from the sky, which means that the meter thinks that more light is hitting the scene, which means it will tell you to stop down more, which means I'll get an underexposed shot. Likewise, if I tilt it like this, the luminosphere sees less of the sky, and therefore my shot's going to be overexposed because it's saying, oh, it's a bit of a drab, gray, overcast day. Uh, there's not much sky peeking through the clouds. So be careful with that. Some people say if you want a meter for your shadows, you can just tilt it a bit, but uh, you can always just take the meter reading there and then add a bit of exposure. That's, uh, yeah, that's the, the deal with these guys. The nice thing about these is also that you get quite a natural rendition. Um, sometimes it's tempting to say, let's just put certain things, certain places in the exposure. You could say, oh, a Caucasian skin tone goes in plus one and, and just meter like that with a spot meter. But with this, it might be an overcast day. The person's face might be in shadow. Uh, the person might be particularly pale or a little bit sunburnt like I am at the moment. The, the thing with the spot meter is that you're you're really placing your scene around the uh, the light meter readings. Um, with with this, your scene just is, and your camera is just exposed for the light. When I meter a scene, and uh, let's be honest, this is most important for things like slide film when the exposure latitude isn't really there. I like to use a combination of both, and uh, I'll show you the reason that having both is quite useful. I always start by taking an instant scene uh, reading. So let's imagine that you're a photographer looking through the video camera and you're trying to meter this scene of me sat at my desk. What I'd start with is uh, obviously video camera on a tripod, walk over to the subject and uh, I can take a reading here for my face. So um, this is giving me an aperture reading of f2.4, which is all well and good, but you don't know if the wall is gonna be blown out, you don't know where the shadows are gonna lie. So what I could do is I could take that as my baseline and I could actually go into spot metering mode at which point I could take a meter off the wall here. And this actually says 4.8. So the wall is one and a half stops over the meter reading scene. That's fine, well within the tolerance of the film. And uh, what's the dark part of the scene? I can fire it at my own shirt. So if I take a meter reading like this, it will say that's 1.2. And I can say, well, that is about, uh, what's that? About two and a half stops away from my previous reading but it's a dark shirt, it's allowed to be dark. If this shirt was uh, middle gray, then the rest of the scene would be massively boosted out of proportion. So that kind of use case is an example of why you might wanna use both. Obviously these Iconics are a little bit fancier, but um, if, you, yeah, if you can have both, it is nice to have. With the camera meter, there are some tricks you can do um, to help with your metering situation. I'm not suggesting you carry around a gray card and <laughs> awkwardly get your camera out and, uh, and point it at your gray card each time you take a photo. But uh, just being aware of where middle grays might be found and, uh, and sort of things that can trick your meter mean that you can be a little bit more savvy using the in-camera meter. For example, watch out for glare in the viewfinder. Um, look for things you can just take meter readings off. People act like the, the light is sort of constantly changing and that there are a million variables. But if you know anything about like sunny 16 metering or even the, the crazy slide charts they used to use in the 19th century, you'll know that the sun is just relatively consistent. The clouds are the only real light mod that affect the sun and that open shade, cloudy days are always pretty consistent. Going back to that bit at the start, metering is really a personal decision. Uh, it's only the photographer and the creative vision that they have that determines correct exposure. So if your meter reading says something crazy, if it starts flashing F22 at you, um, then have a little think about what might be confusing it and think about where you want the detail to be. 
If you're taking a meter reading of a white dog, use a spot meter. Put it a stop or two stops above your middle gray and you'll get a, a much more detailed and accurate picture. If you're taking a picture of your subject and you're using studio lights, walk over to them with your instant meter. Make sure that you're 90 degrees away and you're uh, at the same distance they will be and you'll get a nice meter reading. My next video will be on comparing Ektachrome to Provia, which is exactly the kind of video that you need a spot meter to film. And I would say, uh, yeah, I'd love it if you could subscribe, stick around. If this is interesting, then the next video probably will be as well. Thanks very much for watching, and here's my outro music.